Welcome to the Known Victory Church YouTube channel. We are so glad that you found us today. We exist to make Jesus known and to be a place that anyone can call home. If you haven't yet, make sure to subscribe, like, and share these messages so we can truly make Jesus known in our homes, cities, and across the world. We pray that this message impacts you and helps you to grow closer to Jesus. I don't know if you've ever been empowered to do something like you didn't have the authority, but then like someone with the authority kind of gave you the authority to do something you know what I'm talking about. Um, when Beth and I first had our first baby, Beth empowered me to learn how to change diapers. Um, for real, true story. And uh, the first time, I'll be honest, that was the, honestly, one of the most terrifying moments of my entire career. So at that point in my life. And uh, because first of all, I'd never changed a diaper in my entire life. And in fact, like, I had never even really seen anyone change a diaper except for Beth. And so I'm just learning. And Beth's like, and it's also like she's like over watching every move I make, right? Because she's like, you better do it right. I'm like, I hope I do do it right. Like, I do do. Nice. Um, sorry. It's like fit perfect. <laughs> no. um, but I was like, I hope I do it right. And, but now, after like, what's it, almost three years, I'm a master of changing diapers. I'm pretty good at it, to be honest. Like, I'd say it's one of my top five skills. And once my kids are older, to be honest, it's going to be useless until maybe I get a old, right? And then someone else can do it. You know what I'm talking about? But, uh, but this is just in life, we have moments and things that empower us where people give us the authority, give us the opportunity to do something, to learn something, to kind of overcome something. And what we're going to do is we're going to continue in our series today um, that we called Summer Highlights. And what it is, is we're really just going through um, our favorite verses as a church. And, and as you've sent in your verses, not one of them has been the same, which I think is amazing. Because the Bible is filled with scripture. The Bible is filled with so many verses and stories that have shaped each and every one of us in very different ways. So some people would share their, their verse and say, you know, this verse helped me overcome this, or this verse helped me get through this, or this verse encouraged me to do this. And there's all these stories and all these verses that are really changing um, all of our lives. And I love this series because we get to kind of have insight into one another's life, into each other's story with the verses that have changed us and the verses that have shaped us into who we are in the Bible. I love it. It's so filled with insight and wisdom that we can learn from. And we all have different verses that have spoken to us over the years that we've learned from. And we're going to be going through the next uh, verses today that I, that I have. And this is from Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2 to 3. And this is what it says. It says, and the spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding. The spirit of counsel and and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. He will delight in obeying the Lord. He will not judge by appearance nor make a decision, decision based on hearsay. So these are the two verses that were sent to me, uh, you know, a couple weeks ago, of their favorite verse. And, you know, these are verses that, you know, I know, but I hadn't really, you know, done a lot of um, study in these two verses. But there's so many things, like, to be honest, we could preach an entire series, an entire summer just out of these verses, and I'm going to try and get through them all today. And it's going to be hard, but I'm going to do my best. It's going to be quick. Um, but this, these two verses come right after this in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1. This is the kind of context or the preface of these verses. And Isaiah 11, 1 says this, out of the stump of David's family will grow a shoot. Yes, a new branch bearing fruit from the old root. And this is kind of how the, this, the, the, this, the story or this verse starts is out of the stump of David's family will grow a shoot. And what I know about stumps is that means that the tree is no longer living. Right? The, what this is really saying is that David's family, the stump, the brokenness, all the things that, that yes, he, was, he did amazing things, but it's kind of fallen away. But out of the death, out of the stump, out of this brokenness, a shoot is going to come and new life is going to come. And out of the old root, new life, a new branch will come. And really what this is talking about is Jesus. That out of the stump, out of the death, out of the brokenness, out of it, what's going to happen is Jesus is going to come. And then it goes into this. And then it says, if we go back to that first verse, and the spirit of the Lord will rest on him. And the spirit of wisdom and understanding. And the spirit of counsel and might. 
the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. He will delight in obeying the Lord. He will not judge by appearance nor make a decision based on hearsay. Really, this is talking about Jesus. You know, years and years and years before Jesus was even on this earth yet, before he came and through, through the womb of Mary, before that, this is what it says, the spirit will rest on him who's about to come. What's coming next is gonna be better than what's been. Yes, David had amazing things, but the life that's coming is gonna be better than what was, and the spirit will rest on him. You know, when, and this verse is obviously talking about Jesus, but the promise that when Jesus left, he says the spirit is going to come and meet you where you are. The spirit is gonna rest upon you. The spirit is gonna come upon you as well. And in Galatians 3, verse 13 to 14, Christ redeemed us from the curse. Look at the parallels almost between these verses. Christ redeemed us from the curse, from the stump, from the brokenness of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. So that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. See, we're promised this same spirit. The spirit that is talking about in Isaiah, that it's gonna rest upon him, that same spirit can rest upon us when we give our life to Jesus, when we follow Jesus, when we give him our life, the spirit will meet us and empower us and, be, and fight for us to actually do the things that we're called to do. We receive the same power that Jesus did. And the same spirit that is talked about here for Jesus, that, that God is in the business, if you see, from death to life. And that's exactly what Jesus has done in my life and probably in your life as well. He's taken me from death, from brokenness, from the curse, and brought me into new life and new foundation and new, and new life with him from death to life. That's what God is in the business of doing for you and in the business of doing for me, taking us from death to life, to bringing us from the old, bringing us into the new, bringing us power out of our weakness, bringing us what we desperately need out of the dead things. God will start to build and grow life. He'll do that for you and he'll do that for me through Jesus. We receive the power of the Spirit. And we might feel like everything seems stagnant. Maybe you've gone through life and you feel like everything seems stagnant. Everything seems dead. You just feel like you're going through the motions. You're like, God, I need something new. He's like, spend more time with me. Come into my presence and I'll start to bring life where dead things once were. I don't know if you've ever driven through a spot that used to have a forest fire there. The life you see. When I was younger, my dad, we lived on an acreage. We lived on four acres of land when I was younger and we had a big fire and something about acreages or farms is you like, you just burn everything. Like for real, like you do. Like we got there, there was this big dog house. It was like, I don't know, three feet high. We burned it. It was the biggest fire that I'd ever seen at that point in my life. But one day my dad started a fire and went inside to finish cooking. He comes out, my entire neighbor's lawn is on fire. About an acre of land is burning. What a sight to see. As then, the, of course, the fire department starts showing up. Right, they're pulling up and they're putting out this fire and it's kind of a, it's a big deal. But I'm telling you, they've never had a better lawn in their life. For real. After is the best looking lawn I'd ever seen. See, see what happens in our life is that, is that we get empowered to do things and it can spread like fire and it can do amazing and crazy things is when we realize the power that we have, that, that, that out of the dead things, life will come. And life will come not just mediocre, but life will come abundant in our life. It will come abundant for you. Out of the dead things will come. And then it says, out of the stump, he will come, and upon him will be these things. But in Ephesians 2, 4 to 6, so I'm real excited today. You can probably tell. But God is so rich in mercy, and he loved us so much that even though we are dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Jesus from the dead. It's only by God's grace that you have been saved. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ. That's what we receive when we come from death to life, from sin to grace. But the things that we receive from the Spirit are laid out very simply 
in these, this verse, like really verse two, lays out what we receive from the Spirit. And so number one is, it says, the Spirit rested on him. So rest on him. When you receive the Bible, if you read through the scriptures, you know, you read through Judges, you see the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon people. And then they would always do amazing and incredible things and do things that weren't even possible and God would show up and the Spirit would move. But you see that only kind of certain times throughout the Old Testament, right? Certain people, certain moments where the Spirit would come powerfully upon somebody and then they would do something amazing. But see, when Jesus went to the cross and died, the veil was torn and the Spirit was released into the world. The Spirit that, that, that had been confined was now open and available for all of us. And so what happens is when we give our life to Jesus, the Spirit will come and empower us. It will rest on us. It will anoint us. It will prepare us. It will, it will get us ready for what's about to come. It will give us the promises that we're about to read through. The Spirit will come upon us. And in Acts chapter 1 verse 8, this is what Jesus says. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses. Or to be witnesses telling people everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Telling them about Jesus. It's a point of the power is to spread the gospel. The point is to spread Jesus. When the spirit rests upon us, comes upon us, our responsibility is to go in that power and preach the good news of Jesus. That's the point of this power is to go into the world, into Samaria and Jerusalem and Judea, to the ends of the earth. And sometimes when it's wintertime, I feel like I'm in the ends of the earth. For real. Like, people ch chose to live here years ago, and now I do too. Now, to be honest, I love my country. I love my city. I love the Edmonton Oilers. Like, I, I'm, just, I'm just saying, sometimes it feels like the ends of the earth. When it's minus 40, and I don't want to go outside because it hurts to breathe. But right now it's warm, so I'm, stop talking about the cold. But this is the promise that we will receive the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, our life should be a light to the world. Pro the power is promised to those who follow Jesus, who give them their life, who, who declare that he is Lord. You know, you might not feel like you have the power, but it's time to open up your eyes and open up your heart to see what you already have. And then the second thing that the promise is, is wisdom. Our promised wisdom. And in James 1, 5, it says this, if any of you lacks wisdom, now I don't know about you, but sometimes, most of the time, that's, I feel like that's me. Lacking wisdom. You ever done something or, or you made like an irrational decision and you're like, ah, whoops. Daily. If any of you lacks wisdom, that's me. Let him ask God. It's not complicated. It's not, it's not rocket science. It's not rocket surgery. It's a joke. <laughs> but if any of you lacks wisdom, do what? Let him ask God. And God who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. <laughs> you know, some of us, we feel like we have to be prepared to enter and ask him for wisdom. Right? It's like, we, I've already done my, re my research, God. I'm just asking, asking for your approval. I've already went on Wikipedia, Right? I already know all the info, but God, like, are we good? With this point, he's like, go to him. You might not have anything. You might feel like you don't have any wisdom at all. Say, go to him and let him ask, and God who gives generously without reproach will give it to you. Wisdom is that accessible for those of us who follow Jesus, yet a lot of us, we don't live that way. We don't live in a way that we actually understand and experience the wisdom that we can approach every situation with not just our own minds, but with the mind of Christ as well. You know, in fact, some of the biggest supports for humanity, talk about hospitals and schools and a lot of these things really were developed and created by those who followed Jesus. You look at some of the most incredible art even in our world, it's created by those who followed Jesus back in the day. We can have this wisdom that passes all understanding as well. And, you know, biblical wisdom is not merely knowledge applied to a circumstance. It's a skill of seeing beyond the thin surface of how things appear. 
Some of us, we look at our situation, we look at our circumstance, we look at what's in front of us, and we just see the wall, and wisdom is really seeing past it and seeing what's actually ahead of it. What's actually in front of you, what's actually beyond the thin surface in front of you, wisdom is seeing before you actually see it, really. Understanding God's heart for the situation, understanding what's coming, understanding what's next for you. We have the ability to see past the surface, to see deeper and to see wider because we have access to that mind. The most creative mind that ever existed. The ability to solve problems that no one else can. The ability to, to be creative. You know, whatever you're facing right now, take a moment to ask God for wisdom. Some of us, that's the bottom of our list. I'm going to call my grandpa for wisdom first. He's probably a wise guy. But call upon God. He is the one who will provide the greatest wisdom you could ever ask God for. Because with God, all things are possible. And then the next thing we're promised is understanding. What's the difference between understanding and wisdom? Really, understanding is the ability to translate meaning from facts. And wisdom is knowing what to do next. Given an understanding of the facts and circumstances. You know, they kind of go hand in hand, wisdom and understanding. What do we do with what we see? What do we actually do with it? And this is what the writer of Proverbs said. But understanding, Proverbs 3, 5 to 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do and he will show you which path to take. Has your understanding ever failed you? It sure, sure failed me when I was in school. Sometimes I'd get to a test and I'd see the math problem and think, was this taught this semester? Like I thought we were doing like basic division. It's like I didn't realize it was going to be this convoluted. Our understanding fails us. Have you ever been so confident about the issue in your car and then you fix it and all of a sudden your like engine explodes and you're like, I was wrong. You know what I'm talking about? Like we do this, like we like, I, I'm, YouTube taught me how to do it. You know, like, it's like, yeah, it can. But lean not on your own understanding. We love to do this. We love to lean on our own understanding because we think we're so smart. We think we're so knowledgeable. We think we're so wise that we lean on our own understanding. And what that does is it really just leaves us in shambles. Because we think our understanding is best. We think that we understand the situation perfectly and we know it all. The reality is you most likely don't. And what the Spirit offers us is actually an understanding that when we even have the wisdom of what to do next, if we can have the understanding on how to do it. How do we actually see it? How do we actually go forward? How do we actually do this? We're offered the understanding that surpasses anything else. It goes past it all. And the next thing we're promised is counsel. Now, some of us, I find this is specifically with, with men. We don't like counsel. We don't want to ask for help. And one thing I've noticed about Home Depot, they've trained their employees to not care if you want help. Have you noticed that? I'll go in Home Depot, and I walk three feet, and I've already been asked 16 times if I know what I'm looking for. And I'm like, first of all, no, I don't. Right? Like, I don't know where the tape is. Like, you move it every week. For real. Like I, I, and then eventually I just break because I'm like, you've asked me 20 times. Yes, I need help. I think they have more employees than customers, Home Depot, to be honest. There's a, like you walk in, there's a line of employees with their church literally like this. Standing there just watching you. Being like, you know what you're looking for? Can I help you? Like, I don't want help. I don't want counsel. I'm good. I can do it on my own. But we need counsel. When the situation in front of us, yes, if we want the wisdom, yes, we want the understanding, but do you have God in your life to actually give you the counsel that you need? Proverbs 12, 15. This might be me. This might be you. Fools think their own way is right. But the wise listen to others. Do you listen to what God is speaking to you about what's in front of you? The, the promise of the Spirit is actually to have the understanding, to have the wisdom, to have the counsel from God. And if we want counsel, we want wisdom, we want understanding from anyone on the planet, let's try and get it from the most creative and brilliant mind that has ever been. God. We have access to it. 
Yeah, we don't often live that way. You know what I think? I think that arrogance is the enemy of counsel. You ever told somebody what to do and they do the exact opposite thing? My daughter does that every 25 minutes. Like I'm not, like I wish I was being sarcastic. And now that we have another child, hey, don't pull her legs out because she could fall off the couch and hit her head. Be careful. Pulls her legs out immediately. Like literally it's like, don't do that. Does it again. I'm like, but do you know what? We do the exact same thing. Someone tells you, do this. Get your brakes changed on your car because it's not safe the way you're driving. No. I'm good. Your car breaks down. Your brakes are grinding so much it seizes your tie. Like your, I don't know how it works, but it seizes. Right? We all need counsel. Fools think their own way is right, but the wise listen to others. Are we willing to listen? And God often uses other people to bring us counsel. Are you willing to listen? Because again, I believe that arrogance is the enemy to counsel. And the next thing we're promised is might. Now, mighty is a translation of the Hebrew word gibor, which is defined as strength, power, hero, or warrior. Might. Now, you look at your life, you might be like, wow, I don't, not really strong. I don't, a hero? No chance. I'm not a warrior. I think I've told you before, my name, Dustin, literally means valiant warrior. That's what my name means. Mighty. And this is, we don't feel like we're powerful. We don't feel like we're, we have the strength we need. Ever felt that way? And something comes, you're like, I don't know if I have the strength or the power to actually be the hero in my own story, to be the warrior right now. I don't feel like I can keep fighting. The promise is that we'll receive might. And in Ephesians 6, 10 to 12, this is what it says. It's the whole armor of God. A final word. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. It's not your power. It's his mighty power. Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all the strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. That's why we need might. That's why we need to actually be strong and courageous. It says in Joshua 1, 9, be strong and courageous. Go in go to God's power, his mighty power. We need his power. And that's a promise of the spirit, the power to face all adversity, the, the, the might to face persecution and fear and the power to face the giants and face the mountains and face the storms knowing that God is on our side. We need his might. We need him to actually be the one who supplies the strength we need in the hardest moments. We fight not in our own armor, in our own things. We fight in his armor. You know, in life, we build our own armor to face the world. We learn it through trauma or we learn it through experience. And we learn all these coping mechanisms that we use to try and protect ourselves. But we actually forget to actually put on God's armor. The one that will actually work. The one that actually will supply. The one that will actually protect. I feel so vulnerable. It's because we got on the wrong armor. And in Ephesians 6, we continue on in 13 to 17. It says, therefore, put on every piece of God's armor so that you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then still after the battle, you will still be standing firm. Stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth and the body armor of God's righteousness. For shoes put on the peace that comes with the good news so that you will be fully prepared. In addition to all these, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil. Put on salvation as your helmet and take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. <laughs> you know how we fight the enemy? It seems like so like counterintuitive. You know how we fight the enemy? Truth. How do we fight the enemy? Righteousness. How do we stand firm in the midst of the fiery arrows? Peace. Faith. Salvation. 
in the word of God. That's how we stand firm in the midst of it all. That's how we fight. That's how we defend. That's how we do it. You know, I think all of us, we want to be more courageous. We want to be more courageous at work. We want to be more courageous with our kids. We want to be more strong. We want to be, we want to be able to say no to things. We want to be able to be stronger as humans. You know the best way to do that? Spend time with your Savior. Spend time with Jesus. You want to become mighty? It's not going to the gym. It's not what's going to make you mighty. It might make you mighty. It might make you strong in the eyes of other people. Who cares? How do we become strong for our families? Spend time with Jesus. How do we become people that are heroes and warriors? Learn about peace. Learn about truth. Learn about righteousness. That's how we become strong for our families. That's how we become mighty. It's by growing our spiritual muscles. Knowing the word. Knowing the scriptures. Use your Bible to grow yourself as a follower of Jesus. And the next uh, uh, thing we, we receive from the Spirit is knowledge. Now, the dictionary defines wisdom as the ability to discern or judge what is true, right, or lasting. Wisdom. But knowledge is information gained through experience, reasoning, or acquaintance. So how do we grow our knowledge? Why is this important? It's because it's about experiencing Jesus. It's about having a place where we can actually reason and understand it in our minds, as well as actually having an encounter with Jesus, an acquaintance, actually having a moment where we actually meet him. We learn through knowledge. We, are, we, we, we learn knowledge through experience. We have to experience God. We have to know God. Some of us, we know about him. Because half of the reels that we see on Instagram are about Jesus. And we're like, I know about him, but do you know him? Do you actually understand? Do you actually, can you reason? Can you, can you understand how, how much he's done in your life? Do you know him or do you just know about him? Knowledge isn't just about what you know. It's about what you experience. You know, some of us, we're great at reading. We love reading and we know so much. We love to learn through facts and we love to learn through reasoning and arguments and conversation. And others of us, we learn through experience where we experience something and if we need the hands-on work in order to learn something, both are extremely important. And in uh, Psalm 16 verse 11, it says this, you show me the way of life, granting me the joy of your presence and the pleasures of living with you forever. See, he shows us. We learn from him. We learn how to go through life. We learn how to walk in the Jesus way. We learn how to walk in love. We learn how to take care of people. Like We learn to take care of the widows and the orphans. We learn this and we experience the joy of his presence. We find joy when he's in the room. We can know joy when we experience true joy. When we can comprehend what joy actually is. Do you know, just know about him or do you actually know him? Do you actually know Jesus, do you know what he's done in your own life? And then the last thing that we see in, this, in these scriptures, the last thing is the fear of the Lord. I find this so interesting. You know, the other ones, you know, might and, you know, the other ones, I've lost them in my head, knowledge and wisdom. And then it ends with the fear of the Lord. You know, knowledge and the fear of the Lord go hand in hand. Wisdom and the fear of the Lord go hand in hand. All of it does. In Proverbs 1, 7, right? Fear of the Lord is the foundation of true knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and discipline. If you want to learn and grow in knowledge, well, you have to learn to fear the Lord. You know, Oswald Chambers, this is what he's quoted as saying, the remarkable thing about God is when you fear God, you fear nothing else. Whereas if you do not fear God, you fear everything else. Some of us are walking through life so afraid. We're so scared. We're scared of so many things, so many things that come up, so many things that try and trap us and trick us and persuade us and change us. It's because we're putting our fear in the wrong place. You know, in fact, Charles Spurgeon has a similar quote. This is what he says. 
He says, he who fears God has nothing else to fear. How we can walk in courage, how we can walk in might, how we can walk in it all is when we understand the power and the authority and the omnipotent and omnipresent God that we serve. He's all powerful. He's all knowing. He's everywhere. When we learn to fear the Lord, you don't have to be afraid of anything that's going to happen. We know the one who's all powerful, all knowing, omnipresent, omnipotent. He's on our side. Now, my family, and I, I, I don't like to say this, but my family, we're scared of bees and wasps. We are. I don't like it. You know, sometimes Jane will be playing outside and I'll hear her like blood curdling screaming outside with her window open. And I'm like, she's been stung by a bee. Right? Like I'm, I'm positive. I'm like, there's probably a coyote in her backyard, right? Like there probably is. No, it's like there's a spider on our deck. She's absolutely terrified. And what she'll do is every time she'll scream and she'll say, dad, 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 daddy, I need you, I need you. And me, the mighty man of valor, the valiant warrior, I open the door and I see her sitting there crying and I'm like, don't be afraid. I'll save you. It's like this heroic moment. That's how I become a hero, right? It's like, save my child from a spider, okay? It's like, you know, in her mind, and I don't know exactly what goes in her mind, but I think in her mind, she thinks, okay, my dad is a lot bigger and stronger than that spider. That, my dad is a lot bigger. Sometimes it's a fly, right? Or a grasshopper. I'm like, I'm not a big fan either, though, to be honest. But I think she knows my dad is powerful. My dad is strong. My dad can protect me. My dad can save me. My dad's going to squash that spider and me keep me safe. I think that's what goes on in her mind. She feels like I can't go on my own. I feel like I can't do it on my own. So I'll encourage her that she can do it, and then I'll go and I'll pick her up. You know, to be honest, I have power. I have the strength to hurt her. I do. Right? I do. But I do my best to use my power, my authority, my strength, not to hurt her, but to help her. I think Jane, my daughter, understands the power that I have. But at the same time, she's not, she, she uses it to know that she's going to be safe whenever she needs me. She might wake up in the middle of the night with a nightmare and, and I'll go into her room and she's crying and I sit with her and all of a sudden she can feel safer. Why? Because I'm in the room. The Lord is powerful. He's strong. He, 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 he can do it all. We have to understand his power, understand his strength, and realize that God uses his power to love us, to protect us, to take care of us. That's what he does. The fear of the Lord. You know, when we go through, I just want to read these, these verses uh, one more time. We didn't get to the last part of it, but really just verse two. And the spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, and the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. He will delight in obeying the Lord. He will not judge by appearance nor make a decision based on hearsay. That same spirit we have access to. The spirit that rested upon Jesus, rests upon us to walk in wisdom and walk in knowledge and walk in might and walk in the fear of the Lord and walk in counsel and walk in understanding. That out of the deadest parts, the most dead parts of our life, new life can come and bring life and life to the full. The spirit that rests on us, that gives us wisdom and understanding and brings us counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, we have access to it. Use it. I think it's time to unleash that power in your life. To use the wisdom, to use it all. Now our takeaway today is this, the same spirit that rests on Jesus rests on us. It's time to unleash that power. Let's use it. Use it to love, right? It says the Spirit's gonna come so that you can go into the world and spread my name, spread me, spread the gospel into the nations. 
Let us use this power to draw people to Jesus. Let us use this power to share the gospel with people who desperately need love and support and peace and joy that the gospel offers. Let us do that. So I'm just gonna pray. We're gonna, yeah, I'm just gonna pray for us today because I know that, you know, we need this. I think I need this. I need a reminder often of what actually we have access to. I need a reminder of that I don't have to be afraid. That whatever comes in front of me, I have access to the wisdom of Christ, the wisdom of God, and I can use it to help me through any moment in every situation and every circumstance. So Father, I pray that today, first of all, God, that you meet us where we are. Even if our lives feel so dead and so broken, God, meet us there and spring up new life. And in that life, God, rest your spirit upon us. Help us learn to walk in wisdom and walk in understanding. Help us learn to walk in counsel and walk in might. Help us learn to walk in understanding and help us learn to walk with the fear of the Lord guiding us and going and help us learn to love you even deeper than we do. And God, help us understand, help us unleash this power that we have in Jesus' name. Amen.